It is absolutely my pleasure and honor to serve as the moderator for this panel. And I would like to invite our speakers, our panelists to please come on camera. We, I know that we have Teresa Romero and we also have Mariela in Incapie who's joining us. Um, Jamie and Marcela will be joining hopefully shortly. They may be troubleshooting on the technology side. So just bear with us. Um, as we dive into this conversation, you know, this first panel is called Fulfilling a Progressive Vision for America. And I couldn't be more delighted to be sharing in, in this conversation with individuals who are not only admired, um, are individuals who are making things happen, who are experts in their fields, and they have the added bonus of being guerreras, individuals who fight every single day for our community. And I just wished I, I could really express to you all the stories and all the behind the scenes of how Maria Elena and how Teresa continuously stand up and fight for our community, whether it's on the immigration front or whether it's fighting for our farm workers and fair wages. Just know that these are the leaders of our time. And that's why you hear this excitement in my voice. It's because this dialogue and conversation is going to be terrific. And so let me just do quick intros and uh, kick it off with Mariela, Marielena Incampie. And Marielena is Executive Director of the National Immigration Law Center, also known as NILC, the nation's leading organization dedicated to defending and advancing the rights of low-income immigrants in the U.S. and of the NILC Immigrant Justice Fund. Under her leadership, NILC and the Immigrant Justice Fund strategically combine litigation, policy, communications, narrative change, and movement building to effect transform transformational change. As an immigrant from Colombia, Ms. Incapie brings her lived experience and bilingual bicultural perspective to her work. She has been recognized with numerous awards and I can also tell you that she is an immigrant an Im that immigrated as a child from Medellin, Colombia to Central Falls, Rhode Island and grew up as the youngest in a family of 10 children. She earned her Juris Doctor degree in Northeastern University School of Law. Maria Elena, bienvenida. I also have the pleasure of introducing Teresa Romero. Teresa is the first Latina and first immigrant woman to become president of a national union in the United States. Teresa replaced Arturo Rodriguez as the third president of United Farm Workers in December of 2018. Formerly, she was the union's number two officer as secretary treasurer. She has years of experience overseeing the complex financial management, administrative staff recruitment, personnel, fundraising, IT, and social media operations of a fraud front organization involved in fuel organizing, contract bargaining, and administration, legislative and legal affairs, as well as several international initiatives. Teresa is an immigrant from Mexico who is proud of her U.S. citizenship and Mexican and Zapotecan heritage. She has played an important part in many recent successful union efforts, is absolutely admired by her peers for her work ethic, her calm, competence, organizational skills, ability to build relationship, and most of all, for her si se puede spirit, which always shines through in everything that she does. And so with that, I'm going to start and kick it off to Maria Elena and Teresa with the first question. And, you know, we are living during a global pandemic, a, uh, a pandemic that has impacted our community disproportionately. We know that five out of six Latinos have to leave their houses every single day to work and get paid. And so with that, Maria Elena, why don't we kick it off with you? Can you talk a little bit about how our Latino and communities of color are being affected today um, in this global pandemic, specifically our immigrant community, as we think of this big transition that occurred on January 16th and what we're seeing today? And I'm going to make sure, Maria Elena, hey, that you're muted. Wonderful. Buenos dias. First of all, feliz cumpleaños. Cindy, congratulations on your leadership and to the entire LULAC team. I don't think I've ever shared this with you, but um, one of my first um, 
efforts at social activism was actually starting a LULAC chapter in Rhode Island um, when I think I was a teenager or maybe I had just graduated from college. I don't know. So I have a long history with LULAC. It's wonderful to be here entre familia. Um, so as you mentioned, um, this is such an incredibly important panel to kick off what I believe is uh, really a new era in our nation and to be with these poderosas um, on this panel is really, really wonderful. Um, so thank you again to Lulek for the invitation. Um, Cindy, as you, you, know, you mentioned the impact of the pandemic, the, from a public health perspective, as well as the economic crisis is having a devastating impact on Latino communities. Um, you know, we are experiencing illness and death at four times the rate of other communities. We are experiencing the levels of unemployment um, at uh, high rates, as well as um, our community members are among the essential workers that we are relying on. I know Teresa will talk about this from the farm worker perspective, but it's also healthcare workers, um, people who are taking care of our children, our elderly, our uh, you know family members who are sick, our loved ones, but also people who are working in the restaurants and who are delivering our goods. And so um, the impact of the pandemic cannot be understated. I think we really are, the Latinos are are among the uh, most hard hit among all communities. Um, and there's so much work to be done. Um, I am very, very hopeful um, that under the Biden administration, we are finally going to start working towards achieving um, and advancing towards racial and, equi uh, and economic um, and gender justice and equity, which is so critical uh, in this moment. The last four years have been nothing less than a war on immigrant communities. I mean, let's remember that as uh, the former president, when he was candidate, came down the escalator, he began his campaign by attacking our communities, by attacking Mexicans and Latino immigrants. Um, and we can't underestimate that at the core of that has been an anti-Blackness, uh, a, a white supremacist, white nationalist agenda and, and vision for our country. Latinos, along with communities of color, um, one of the most historic multi-generational and multi-racial coalitions delivered this victory for the Biden and Harris administration. So I am very hopeful that they understand um, that they need to deliver on that uh, victory and that we are expecting uh, pro-immigrant, pro-Latino uh, changes to be made both administratively through executive orders, but also with Congress. And we'll talk more about that as we're expecting um, the US Citizenship Act to be introduced this Thursday, for example. Thank you so much for that, Maria Elena. And as you can imagine, today and this week is an absolutely busy week um, on the immigration front. And you know, before bring, coming on board, we were in the the waiting room talking about how the how it's been busy for the last four years. And absolutely, I know that Maria Elena will be doing double time in the months ahead. I'm now going to turn to you, Dr. Uh, Teresa, and um, I wanted to ask you, and you know, one of the statistics that I use is that five out of six Latinos have to leave their houses every single day to work and get paid. And I know you are on the forefront of leading our farm workers, so I wanted you to talk about one, our farm workers who are our heroes, our essential workers, making sure that you and I are nourished and also talk about what more can we do as advocates, as leaders who are learning to use our voice and activate. Let me see, I know that you're muted, Teresa. Jorge or Beatriz, are you able to unmute Teresa, please? Yes, so we can okay. hear you now. I think I was able to do it. Great. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you very much. And feliz cumpleaños. Um, the UFW uh, and Lulac have been working together to uh, help immigrants for many, many years through our history. I, I echo what Maria Elena said. You know, the last four years have been very difficult, uh, even more difficult for, for, for immigrants. Uh, than before. Uh, we were demonized, we were, ca we were called rapists, murderers, uh, killers, and 
That is absolutely not true. We contribute to the economy uh, of this country like anybody else, and we get very um, little recognition for the work that we do. Uh, we've uh, within the union and with our movement, we've always known that farm workers are essential. And uh, when it was convenient, uh, the previous administration recognized that they were essential. However, they continue to be treated in, and I'm gonna repeat the words of one of our members, which broke my heart because he says, we continue to be treated as uh, if we were disposable. And uh, that has affected our communities in, in a deep way uh, that, that unless we like organizations like yours really understand um, what is happening, the, the community in general don't. When you have farm workers that come to you and say, years, you know, before Trump, I worried about immigration, you know, I, something could happen. But they said, now I have to tell my seven-year-old, my nine-year-old what they need to do if, I don't, if we don't come home. So these children who are US citizen are waking up every morning, the parents go to work, and they don't know if they're going to come home. Now we need to understand, you know, farm workers are, like you said, uh, Cindy, putting food on our table. And um, we're hoping and we're working with the new administration um, on, on, on immigration reform. And we understand that farm workers, we don't have to tell it to, to the new administration. The work that they do day in and day out is what not only keeps food on our table, but keeps the agriculture industry strong in this country. So it is time for us this, that we start recognizing and treating them not like disposable and treating them like the essential workers and human beings um, that, that they are in, in and bring some change. Now, how can we get involved? I think we, this, what you're doing today is important because you're re helping us be a voice for the people that can't be here today. Be a voice for them to know that having uh, a legalization and path to citizenship is what probably most of us here have gone through and they deserve it. They, they have earned it. So um, I think right while you're doing here right now, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a great uh, opportunity for, for people to hear about our communities. Teresa, mil gracias, and congr congratulations again for being the first Latina uh, president to lead UFW. And, you know, to our audience tuning in, you know, Teresa and I share that in common, but it also tells you um, in the context of gender equity, how much work we still have to do to make sure that more women Latina leaders are at the helm of organizations. I am now going to introduce Dr. Marcela Nunez-Smith. And Dr. Nunez Smith is Associate Professor of Internal Medicine, Public Health and Management, Inaugural Associate Dean for Health Equity Research, Founding Director of the Equity Research and Innovation Center, Director of the Center for Research Engagement, Associate Cancer Center Director for Community Outreach and Engagement at the Yale Cancer Center, Chief Health Equity Officer at Smilo Cancer Hospital, Deputy Director of Health Equity Research and Workforce Development at the Yale Center for Clinical Investigation, core faculty in the National Clinician Scholars Program, research faculty in the Global Health Leadership Initiative, Director of the Pawson Commonwealth Fund Fellowship in Health Equity Leadership, and co-director of the Doris Duke Clinical Research Fellowship. I know that many of you are wondering, when does she sleep? Um, I'm wondering that as well. Um, she is doing a lot of work. Most importantly, she's the co-chair of the COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force under President Biden. And so with that, I, I wanted to end it on a personal note. And we know that Dr. Nunez Smith has mentored dozens of trainees since completing her fellowship and has received also numerous awards for teaching and mentoring. She's originally from the US Virgin Islands. She attended Jefferson Medical College where she, has, she was inducted into the Alpha Omega Alpha Medical Honor Society. And she earned her BA in biology Anthropology and Psychology at Swarthmore College. With that, Dr. Nunez-Smith, bienvenida. Welcome to LULAC. 
Thank you. And I wanted to ask you, as someone who is at the forefront of tackling COVID-19, um, as you know, we know that communities of color, our Latino community, our African-American community, our Native American community have disproportionately been impacted. And, you know, just to share some of the stories of what we're seeing, as so many of our LULAC councils did food and financial relief efforts, we had families. And this was a story shared by Lenny Gonzalez out of Virginia, where mothers were deciding if they could purchase tortillas and masa and cooking oil versus laundry detergent. And that when they're showing up to the clinics and to the hospitals, the first questions are around food insecurity, financial insecurity, and then maybe the question or comment may come up around the vaccine. And so in this context, Dr. Marcela Nunez-Smith, and in your new role, um, I wanted to ask, you know, what is it that the task force is tackling right now, aside from trying to save our, our country from this pandemic, um, and what more could our communities of color um, understand about COVID-19? With that, I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much, Cindy. It's just great to be here. Um, Feliz cumpleaños. This is very exciting, and I'm so grateful to be on the panel with these esteemed uh, co-panelists. Um, I, uh, I, I'm gonna try to listen as much as I, as I talk today because even you know, what you shared and was shared before, I think it is so important that we anchor ourselves in both the statistics that we all know too well and are too grim, but also the personal narrative. You know, each, every time we say the hospitalization rates are two times or mortality rates, and it, it, it really, I think allows people to turn numb to the fact that we're talking about our family members, our community members, our neighbors, our, you know, our uncles, our loved ones. I mean, you know, to look around, we have all lost loved ones, I'm sure, to COVID-19. Um, it, it, uh, it is a very humbling honor to serve as, as chair um, for the federal uh, COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force. Um, you know, President Biden, Vice President Harris have been really sincere, committed to making sure that we center on equity in, in our response and, and perhaps even more importantly in the recovery. You know, the task force itself um, is a group that is established actually very much um, with gratitude to the vice president because it's a, the blueprint was there from when she was in the Senate and introduced this legislation. But President Biden has, has selected the members and acts that we um, really roll up our sleeves and get to work thinking about recommendations in terms of uh, COVID-19 resources to make sure that the allocation and access is equitable. So, you know, we're talking about people who are on the front line, essential workers working every day with deep dignity um, for the benefit of the rest of us. So how do we make sure that people have the PPE that they need, for one example? You know, thinking about access to testing, um, thinking about access to therapies, you know, we now have um, very promising therapies. If in fact we can get diagnosed early enough with COVID-19, there are things we can do to treat that actually prevent hospitalization and prevent death. But how do we make sure every community and everybody has access to those? And of course, top of mind for so many people, vaccines. And this is so important. I think it's key. I mean, thank you to LULAC for all that you do and for all the advocacy. This is very important as we have conversations about vaccination that people know that vaccines are free, that we're gonna make them accessible, that there is no data sharing, that IDs are optional, right? So that we can think through all of the policy barriers that have been in existence before under previous administration, um, but that uh, President Biden is very intent on removing. But thinking about COVID-19 resources, uh, very important, but we also have to look beyond how do we build resilience in the recovery? So how do we think about pathways to educational economic opportunity for everybody who lives in our country? So the agenda is ambitious for the task force, but we look forward so to continue to partnerships with LULAC and others um, in doing that work. Thank you so much, Dr. Nunez Smith. And you know, just a shout out to you as well for you know being there to listen to all the community partners and being ready to um, be an ally in, in terms of what we're seeing and hearing on the ground. And, and so know that you know we absolutely are, are observing, participating, and will be as helpful as possible as we hear directly from our Latino community through our councils as members in the community um, and pipe that up to the administration. 
I wanted to shift um, as we saw the transition on January 16th and wanted to ask and maybe start with you, Teresa, and then head over to Maria Elena. What are your thoughts on the Biden administration's actions in regards to your perspective movement? What more needs to be done? And what can we as advocates do? So Teresa, why don't you get it started? Okay. Uh, thank you, um, Cindy. You know, the U.S. agriculture industry historically uh, relied on people of color uh, to put food on our tables from predominantly African Americans in the South to mostly uh, migrant and seasonal workers from Mexico, uh, Jamaica, California. And if you think about it, uh, farm workers, we have made progress but we are so far behind on where every other employee uh, in this country is. And let me give you an example. Um, in California, just in 2016, farm workers earned uh, the right to overtime after eight hours. And it, has to be, it had to be phased in because they were not getting any overtime pay until after 10 hours a day. Right now, they're getting overtime pay after eight and a half hours, and next year is going to be like everybody else, eight hours. But then uh, in Washington, in California, but I'm sorry, in New York, uh, uh, they, they, we have uh, fought for these rights, but in the rest of the, the country, farm workers don't have this right. Farm workers don't have the right to organize. Farm workers um, have been treated with um, a, a second class citizens. And I think it is time, and we're hoping that this administration can understand that farm workers are, um, uh, as a labor force, deserve the same rights to, to, that other people, do, other workers do. For example, here in California, we had to fight for a, a couple of decades to make sure that there were some safety standards for farm workers when the temperatures were very high and they were uh, dying in the fields. And when you have to fight for decades for farm workers to have shade, water, cold water, uh, and uh, be um, a 10 minute period rest when the temperatures get above uh, 95, when you have to fight for decades for that, it is just inhumane. It, it, nobody else has to go through that. And it, nobody else should be able to go through that. And this is the only state where we have those provisions. So the fight it is to protect farm workers throughout the country. And I think this administration, uh, 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 Vice President uh, Kamala Harris, when she was a Senator, and when she was here in California, was very supportive of these efforts. And we are hoping that with her, their leadership, both uh, President Biden and Vice President Harris, we're going to be able to change this and make sure the farm workers have the rights of like any other worker in this country. Thank you so much, Teresa, for that. And I know, uh, Marcela, that you had you know, already mentioned some of the things that the task force is doing. Could you elaborate a little bit, you know, just focusing perhaps on the first 100 days and understanding that this new administration just came in in terms of uh, what the task force seeks to do in these next three months? Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the things to need to, to say is, you know, as the task force, we um, obviously are going to be doing a, a, a lot of work and have a lot of ground to cover. The first meeting of the task force is, is next week. But for everybody to understand that the task force is one piece of a broader equity landscape, um, even when we talk about COVID-19 health equity, the White House uh, COVID response team is very much centering on equity um, already. And so, you know, just in terms of one, uh, one example, if we're talking about um, vaccinations, the, uh, we know that the primary vehicle for people to get access to, to vaccination is through um, the, the allocations that go directly to the states and locals and the federal government is working in close partnership with them. 
But we know that sometimes there might be a need for, for additional um, sort of access points, particularly for some of the communities that we're talking about. So even in this first month, um, you know, we've launched four different federal vaccination programs, people to get into community. And so, you know, that includes the community vaccination centers. And so you might see some of those on the news now in terms of the mass vaccination centers, but you know, they can come in different sizes and shapes. And we really want to get into neighborhoods and think schools and school gyms and places like that. You know, we also um, launch in conjunction with that mobile units to be able to get out to where people are, you know, we see a lot of kind of people chasing vaccine, but sometimes vaccine is going to have to go find people. And so we have the mobile unit program for that. You know, we also have the federal retail pharmacy program, and that is with chain pharmacies, local independent pharmacies as well. Um, and then just last week, we announced our partnership with community health centers um, and all of those programs, like to be clear, so these are vaccine allocations the federal government gives directly to these programs above and beyond what the states have. And with, um, with guidance around kind of making sure that those programs get to communities that have been hard hit, communities that are typically hard to reach. So that's kind of, that's one example in terms of the vaccination space of work that we're doing. But we know that that's the beginning, right? Connecting people with, with vaccination is, um, you know, is it, it takes access and more in terms of the reassurances and other things that we've been talking about. And, and recognizing there are particular groups, we think about agricultural workers, for example, that we are working hard to think through, how do we make sure that that group has access to vaccination? Thank you so much for that, Dr. Nunez-Smith. I want to quickly uplift that we have our national president, Domingo Garcia, who is actively engaging on chat. Um, and one of his asks is to please input your ideas in the chat. Know that we have a lot of lulakers across the country. I saw our VP for the Northeast, Ralina Cardona on the chat, our national vice president for our young adults, welcoming all eMERGE students and young leaders as well. So know that we are here, we're taking notes and we are recording um, as well as streaming live. Now, as, as I talked, we actually have eMERGE students from across the country who are joining us. And again, part of our role as a civil rights organization is to continue to advocate and to train our leaders to be the best advocates at the local, state, and federal level. And so with that, a general question, why is it important for young leaders to become involved in your movement or any movement? Why is it so important that as a Latino community, we continue to train our leaders to make sure that they are not afraid to speak up and that we advocate and use our political power uh, to make sure that our issues are heard? And so with that, I'm gonna kick it off to Marielena, Marielena first, uh, then Marcela, and we'll then go to Teresa. Marielena? Excellent. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, yes, thank you so much for that question, um, Cindy. Listen, there is no social movement throughout all of our world history without young people. Um, if, you, if we read up our history and learn on our history, including so many of the civil rights leaders from the United States, when you look back, they were in their 20s. Some of them started their activism in their teen years. And so this is a moment where we need transformational change. And we have a responsibility, like part of being a leader is leadership development, is, is making sure that we are um, supporting young people to play their role, to use their moral imagination imaginational to help us develop the country and the society that's grounded in racial and economic and gender justice and equity that they will then be able to have for their future generations as well. It's one of the reasons we at the National Immigration Law Center, for example, are so proud to have been the fiscal sponsor for the United We Dream Network from 2008 to 2012 when they finally became independent. You know, now they are the largest undocumented youth-led organization in the country, really leading the fight for immigrant youth to be recognized through a pathway to citizenship, which we hopefully will happen in the next couple of months. And so absolutely, we need to have um, to create space at the table, decision making tables for young people to help lead. And it's our responsibility to do so. Gracias, Maria Elena. And Dr. Nunez-Smith, you know, as, as, as you know, we need so many more Latinas 
uh, more African American, Native American, API uh, individuals in the STEM and clinical fields. What would you say as someone who has mentored individuals of why we need you to, to think or consider going into this particular field? Oh my goodness, we need you. I, you know, I hold hope and optimism because of youth. I couldn't agree more. You know, transformative change. This is this is your generation. Um, you know, what we think specifically about about STEM. You know, representation matters. You know, I think if we didn't know it before, we, we know it now. And, you know, I was in a meeting right before this where we were talking about kind of the work that healthcare systems need to do around self-interrogation um, and anti-racism and kind of how do those organizations have those conversations. And I was like, one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is who even is within those organizations, right? We look at things like representation in the physician workforce, you know, and it is, uh, it's it's quite abysmal how underrepresented our communities of color are in the profession and that's across the healthcare professions and so i encourage people to get engaged and, and, and involved and one of the things i'm really excited about is on the task force um the biden harris covid 19 health equity task force one of our you know one of our 12 members is vincent torenzo who is a mm -hmm. latino high school student uh who lives in florida and we mm -hmm. know you know this was um a collective recognition from the the highest levels of our administration um, that we need youth at the table when we're talking about this kind of transformative change. So absolutely come on over. And we have interns at my research center. So if anybody wants to learn more about health equity research, definitely available to talk about that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Nunez-Smith. And Teresa, I, I know that UFW comes from a long legacy uh, from Cesar Chavez and so many other leaders who have always led movement and worked for the protections of our workers. What would you tell our young leaders who don't know what organizing is or who may be thinking that their voice does not matter? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank, thank you, thank you very much, Cindy. You know, you're right, we're organizers. And, and uh, the UFW movement was created with um, very young people uh, um, organizing uh, uh, their communities. In um, the last few years, we have had several campaigns, either to pass our bills, either to support a candidate, uh, to work on immigration reform. And we have, uh, gotten very, very young people engage and organize these people so they understand what it takes to make change, to get them to feel, uh, to have that taste of, of the possibilities that are there. You know, our communities are growing. We're not going to be a minority for a long time. So we need to make sure that young people, they're, they understand that they're their future of this country and that their engagement is, is key if we wanna make changes. If you think about Black, Black Lives Matter uh, uh, protests that were happening, one of the things that I saw uh, uh, during those protests were young, multi, multi, multicultural, uh, uh, in, 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 in every single state that had protests, peacefully protesting for rights, they were doing it, many of them for the first time. And they understood and they felt um, that they do have the power to make change if they get involved. And uh, with the same thing with the, with the UFW, we always have young people that come, that we mentored. Some of them stay at, with the UFW. Some of them go back to the, their communities and really start uh, getting engaged and get other people engaged, especially when they're, when they're still students. So I, I think that if all of us really truly uh, reach out to, to, to our, our young uh, community, um, there is so many great leaders there and we're gonna find them. Gracias Teresa for that. And you know, as we shift back to policy and this is specifically for Maria Elena and for you Teresa, um, we're, you know, what are examples of you know, additional legislation or things that may be coming down the type 
that we should consider pushing for, where we as community members need to pick up the phone, email our members of Congress, and by the way, this also happens at the state level, and you know, how can those legislations impact our community? And, and what I'm trying to do here is make the connection of why it's so important that these offices, whether senators or whether a member of Congress hear directly from us. So Maria Elena, I'll kick it off to you and then turn over to Teresa. Sure, thank you, Cindy. So yes, yeah, so there is an immediate opportunity for all of us to be engaged. Look, we have to learn from past experience, which is we collectively, right? It's we are the people are what makes change in this country. And so part of us make wanting the Biden administration to make change requires us to also be in partnership with the Biden administration. And um, as I mentioned earlier, um, this Thursday, we're expecting the introduction of the US Citizenship Act, which is the Biden administration's um, blueprint. Basically, it's their vision for what immigration should look like in this country. And it is a, I mean, I can't tell you how exciting this is to finally have an administration that is saying we should have all 11 million people who are currently in our country that are aspiring citizens finally get on, on, on that path to citizenship. We also know, however, that we have a really narrow margin in the Senate and the House. And so we believe in Teresa and I, our organizations are both part of a campaign where we are um, calling on Congress and asking you to call on your elected members um, to make sure that we quickly moved the Dream and Promise Act um, to a vote. So the Dream and Promise Act would provide citizenship to young immigrants, right? The so-called dreamers, as well as our long-term residents who have been um, living with temporary protected status that they get on a path to citizenship. And that can happen really quickly if the House of Representatives brings that to a vote before April because that bill had been already approved by the House. So that can happen quickly. Same thing with the Farm Worker Modernization Act. And I'm sure that Issa will speak more about that to put farm workers on that path to citizenship. And then lastly, I'll say essential workers, right? Again, 80% of the essential workers in our country right now are immigrants. Um, and the, I'm sorry, 70%. And the majority of them, 80% are undocumented. And so we can't say that they are our heroes and sheroes and be celebrating the work of essential workers without finally recognizing them legally, right? And so it's time that we put essential workers on a fast track to citizenship as well. I'll just close by saying that in order to do that, we have to create the political and cultural conditions, right? The narrative change for members of Congress to understand that it's not enough to call people essential. Look, as Teresa mentioned, our people have been doing this work before the pandemic. They're doing it now and they will always continue to do it. And at the end of the day, it's not about our labor, right? It's about our humanity. Like immigrants are essential because we are immigrants because we are people that are contributing in so many different ways to our society. And so we at the National Immigration Law Center launched about a year ago, almost in May, um, the Immigrants Are Essential campaign. And so if you go to immigrantsareessential.org, you'll see the beautiful artwork where we're partnering with artists and our partners at the Resilience Force work to, work, that works at the intersection of climate, labor, and migration to amplify the stories of all of the different immigrants who are essential to our nation who should be on a fast track to citizenship. So please make sure that you are reaching out to your members of Congress and, and call on them to do that as soon as possible. Yes, Maria Elena. Teresa? Yes, um, I, I agree with everything that Maria Elena uh, said. And uh, we've been working together and making sure that we are, um, um, we move the bills that, that uh, we have been working on for a long time. We will, um, in 2019, uh, we, they, we passed in the House the Farm Workforce Modernization Act. And uh, it passed with uh, the support of 34 Republicans. And this is the first time this has never has been before. Uh, Rep uh, Republicans that were always voting against um, any immigration bill. Lulek um, endorsed our bill. And we thank you for that because we need all the support that we can get right now. There is an opportunity to move um, before March 12th, these bills that Marilena mentioned, Dream, Promise, and Farm Workforce Modernization Act. And for the first time in many, in many decades, most of these immigrant groups are in, in, in alliance on, we need to get wins for our people and we need to get, get them uh, soon. Um, 
the, 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 the key day for, for us is March 12th. These three bills uh, probably would, uh, if they're moved through the, the house before March 12th, we have an opportunity to uh, legalize over four and a half million people and continue to working with the, the, the White House to make sure that the Biden bill is still moving forward and he's gonna have the support of all the immigrant groups in the country. So this is an opportunity with the new administration to really make and bring changes for our community, meaningful changes to our communities. Gracias, Teresa. And as we close out this panel, I wanted to ask Dr. Marcela Nunez-Smith for any parting thoughts um, as we shift. Dr. Nunez-Smith. Oh, thank you. I mean, this this has just been tremendous. I'm so honored to have been a part of this conversation. You know, I want to say, you know, the lines of communication, I, I hope will will stay open. Um, you know, for us on the task force and the work we're doing in equity, we know that we need to show up, we need to listen, um, and then we need to respond. So please, please, you know, and thank you for just holding us accountable. You know, let us know when we're getting something wrong. We want to know, we want to, we want to course correct. Um, and along the way, of course, just as I'm sure you're tired hearing, but please keep doing what you're doing, wear your mask, socially distance, um, and, you know, ask your questions from somebody who's trusted, get the information you need about the vaccination so that you'll be ready when it's, when it's your turn. Everybody take care. Thank you so much. Gracias, Teresa, Maria Elena, and Marcela for joining us today. It has been an absolute pleasure to have this dialogue. And if you're not following them on social media, please do so. They are really creating transformative change across the country at the front line of defending and protecting nuestra comunidad. Please make sure that you also follow these wonderful uh, leaders that are creating change today, ahora in 2021. 